Good morning, and thank you for joining today's congressional briefing with experts from the Global Environment Facility, or the GEF, and its COVID-19 pandemic task force. The panel will discuss origins and drivers of COVID-19 and other emerging zoonoses and ways in which GEF programs are responding to the pandemic. I'm Susan Lilas, Executive Vice President of the ICCF Group. Um, we're a nonprofit organization which supports the leadership of the Bipartisan International Conservation Caucus and the United States Senate and House of Representatives. And we also support the leadership of 17 congressional and parliamentary conservation caucuses throughout Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America, including the newest in South Africa and Indonesia, launched since March, even during the pandemic. Jeff's support for our work with caucuses outside the US has been invaluable and has yielded much success. These caucuses have played a key role in the passage of over 30 pieces of legislation just in recent years. I wish to welcome our panelists, the representatives of the Jeff's COVID-19 Task Force, members of the US Congress who will join throughout the event as their schedules permit, congressional staff joining us on Zoom and on live stream and all others joining via live stream from US government, from parliaments and governments around the world, the NGO community, the private sector and multilateral and educational institutions. So a little bit about the Jeff for those who might not be familiar. The Jeff is a multilateral financial mechanism created in 1991 to provide grants to developing countries for projects and programs that address biodiversity loss, climate change mitigation and adaptation, degradation of international waters, lands, and forests, ozone depletion, elimination or reduction of persistent organic pollutants and mercury. It's a partnership of 183 countries working together with institutions, with civil society and the private sector to help tackle our planet's most pressing environmental challenges while supporting national sustainable development initiatives. The Jeff is an independently operating financial organization and the designated financial mechanism for five conventions, including the Convention on Biological Diversity. And it is also a designated financial mechanism for the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. Since its establishment, the Jeff has funded over 4,500 projects in 170 countries and many thousands more through the Jeff Small Grants Program providing $20.5 billion in grants that has leveraged $112 billion in co-financing. The work of the Jeff is critical to restore and maintain functional natural ecosystems around the world, which is key to mitigating and preventing future environmental crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic. So our panelists this morning um, are all part of the Jeff's COVID-19 task force and they include Kent Redford, uh, Principal for Archipelago Consulting, Dr. Peter Daszak, President of EcoHealth Alliance, Dr. Sarah Olson, Associate Director of Epidemiology in the Health Program at Wildlife Conservation Society, and from the Jeff, Mark Zimski, Senior Biodiversity Specialist. Now, following the presentations, we will host a question and answer period. We've received questions from congressional offices, which we'll present to the panelists, as well as taking questions from congressional staff on the call, and if time permits, through chat on live stream. For those asking questions on the Zoom call, please use the raise hand or chat privately option. We will mute all the microphones. Um, please unmute yourself when you're speaking. So I would now like to invite Kent Redford to speak about the Jeff's COVID-19 Pandemic Task Force. Kent? Thank you very much, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you all for joining us. In May of this year, the Global Environment Facility released a document entitled Jeff's Response to COVID-19, an Action-Oriented Agenda. In its introduction, it laid out the global situation in stark terms. And I read from it. The current corona pandemic is forcing humankind to confront what we have long suspected but too often chose to ignore. What ultimately drives the transmission of infectious pathogens from wildlife to human populations with mounting social and economic impact is the unrelenting degradation of nature. The COVID-19 pandemic is just the most recent and vivid example of how human pressure on nature and natural systems is exposing humans 
to grave health risks with wide ranging and lasting consequences for society and for the stability of national and global economies. In this document, the Jeff laid out a menu of shorter term, medium term, and longer term actions that it proposed taking. One of the short term actions was the creation of a task force designed to support analyses on the future risks linked to emerging infectious diseases along with their root causes, including their connection with deforestation and ecosystem fragmentation. The task force consists of representatives from like-minded institutions with complementary skills and experiences from science, policy, private, and public sectors. It, it, serves the it serves as a platform to quickly develop and implement the actions as well as any other priority actions that are deemed essential. In early April, Naoko Ishii, former GEF CEO, issued invitations to institutions to nominate members of the task force. The task force currently is composed of members from EcoHealth Alliance, Global Wildlife Conservation, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the International Conservation Caucus Foundation, our hosts today, uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society, World Bank, World Wildlife Fund, UNEP, UNDP, as well as Jeff's Scientific and Technical Advisory Panel with support from Market Power Consulting. The task force began meeting June 9th with the purpose of providing this guidance and advice on the following particular aspects of the Jeff Action Plan. First, review and refine a draft of the Jeff's COVID-19 response. This would consist of filling immediate gaps in Jeff's efforts to deal with the wildlife trade and consumption challenges, addressing issues that include the way that the Global Wildlife Program is used to provide support for developing countries that need help to handle unchecked consumption of wildlife, provide similar short-term help to plug gaps in protected area management, explore how relevant projects could be fitted with campaigns on public awareness and behavior change, and gather and disseminate inf information. Second, to consider if and how a crowdsourced mechanism could be created for innovative solutions to address the root causes of virus outbreaks. Third, to identify essential activities in key Jeff projects and programs that may seriously compromise existing gains and future outcomes. This would include activities linked to protected area management, as we've referred, enforcement activities linked to environmental degradation and supporting local operations amongst others. And we'll include examination of how the crisis affected a set of Jeff's strategic platforms, including those directed at food security, cities, mining and mercury, as well as circular economy projects. Fourth, to examine existing and ongoing research into the root causes of the present pandemic, to ensure that Jeff and its partners have the latest understanding of the crisis and the science underlining it. And finally, to provide expert assessment and support the development of a white paper, which is currently being developed on identifying the future risks linked to emerging infectious diseases and other issues, including human welfare linked to environmental degradation. The task force meets every two weeks on WebEx for an hour and a half. To date, we have covered the following topics sustainable forest management and the Amazon landscape, zoonotic diseases, wildlife trade, food systems, land use, and behavior change. The current configuration of the task force will remain through the end of 2020. It is an exciting and dynamic group that has already provided important input to the Jeff, and we are pleased to have a chance to talk about our work today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kent. Um, so the task force is truly bringing together all sectors to respond to this crisis and to look at a broad range of issues. Some of these we're going to uh, examine more closely on this call today. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Daszak, who will speak to the origins and drivers of COVID-19 and other emerging zoonosis. Peter? Well, thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen okay. Great. Um, you know, when we look at pandemics, we often think, well, where do these things come from? Why are we suddenly seeing a, such a bizarre situation as a bat origin virus moving through our neighborhoods, affecting our families and friends? And it just seems very strange. But actually, if you look at the patterns of uh, pandemic emerging diseases over the last couple of hundred years, you start to see real trends. And one of those trends is that 
they tend to be caused by viruses that tend to originate in wildlife, which is exactly what we've seen with COVID-19. So I want to talk a little bit about that in the context of why this is happening. Um, so first of all, let's, let's just um, look at the um, underlying issues on the planet. And this is something that Jeff addresses every day as a core issue. And we're in this period of the Anthropocene, the point in history at which humans have such an impact on the planet that we're changing the climate, the geology, the water supply, um, the forest, the land cover, um, the species. We dominate biomass on the planet. Um, the vast majority of biomass on, on the planet right now is humans and our livestock that we eat. Um, so if you can look at this sort of period between 1950 and now, we call this the Great Acceleration, where population increased dramatically, urban population, water use, transportation. And of course, now we're in this incredible period of time, the telecommunications spike, which is ongoing. Um, along with those things, there has been some very positive benefits, including uh, lifting people out of poverty around the world. And that's one of the drivers for, for a lot of the... Um, sustainability that we're hoping to see around the planet. But there's also been a lot of impact. Um, and I want to point out a couple of things in particular. We all know about the increase in carbon dioxide and the impact that has on the climate, but look at tropical f forest loss, the bottom left-hand side, um, where we're just continuing day by day to, to um, drive roads into new areas and, and encroach into wildlife um, populations. And that's really what's driving pandemic risk. So if we look over the past 100 years or so, um, we hear a lot about the Spanish flu, we hear a lot about the 1918 great influenza pandemic, um, which was the last really large-scale global outbreak that could affect anybody in, in your neighborhood. It's a wildlife origin disease. Um, genes from genetic code from wild bird flu strains mixed with poultry and then got into people. And at least that's what the current thinking is and then spread very rapidly to cause an outbreak. But we've seen a whole series of these outbreaks. Um, HIV AIDS, a chimpanzee origin virus that got into people and spread insidiously and has affected over 30 million people on the planet. Um, SARS, a bat origin virus that emerged out of the wildlife markets of South China and now COVID-19. If you track those origins of new diseases over time, they're increasing exponentially, even when you correct for the number of people looking for them that are finding them. And what that tells us is the exponential rise in underlying um, environmental factors is driving an exponential rise in pandemics. So we cannot continue business as usual. And business as usual right now is to wait for pandemics to emerge and rapidly develop drugs and vaccines. Some won't, some of them will. If we continue to make contact with species in this way, um, and often through things like the wildlife trade, we're gonna run into those viruses and it's not gonna end well. We estimate there are about 1.7 million unknown viruses in mammals and water birds on the planet that could emerge in the future. That's a huge number. We don't even know what they are yet. We know about 4,000 or so. Um, so I apologize for this picture, but let's get the reality check on this. This is SARS. This is the wildlife market where SARS emerged. We worked there just after the outbreak. And what you see is a place where animals are brought into a city in diversity with wildlife and domestic species mixed together. They're kept live, one on top of the other, um, under crowded stress conditions. They're um, sold to people live who take them home and kill them and expose themselves to their pathogens. They're mixing pathogens in the market. And you'll hear from Sarah about some interesting work that shows these are a fundamentally high-risk area. So it really is no surprise to us working in this field that COVID-19 seemed to emerge in a market. It's called the seafood market, Huanan Seafood Market. It sells wildlife and, and in quite large numbers, or it did. Um, we don't know if the virus actually spilled over from wildlife to people there or whether this market was somewhere where people associated with the wildlife trade came together and spread a virus they were already carrying. But it was clearly involved in the early spread of COVID-19. If we look at the genetic code of COVID-19, um, we can see the red ones in this, um, this 
it's really a phylogenetic tree. It's a relationship between different viruses. And what you see is that the ones called Wuhan, they're the um, uh, SARS coronavirus 2, and the closest relative is a bat origin coronavirus. And all of the relatives are bat origin coronaviruses. There are a couple from pangolins that seem to be um, where pangolins have been in the trade and have picked up viruses along the way. But really, this is a bat origin virus. And, you know, China was ready for SARS. It had um, methods in place to look for outbreaks of pneumonia and deal with them very efficiently. We all thought they would. But what we didn't know about this virus was that it spreads quietly in pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic people. And by the time China did pretty radical lockdowns um, in mid to third week of January, it had already spread. And this is a, 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 what we do with the Department of Homeland Security tracking travel patterns and predicting where passengers will go. And as you can see, by then the cat was already out of the bag. Um, the virus had gone to the US, it had gotten into Europe and other countries and was beginning to spread silently here. So that's what happened. So where did this virus come from? What can it tell us about future threats? This is a, a, a beautiful part of countryside in, in Southwest Yunnan province, Southern China, near the border of Myanmar and Laos. And you can see tea plantations. It's really a rural, quite traditional farming community. Uh, but it's about two hours drive from a city of 10 million people, uh, Kunming. Um, it, if you travel around, you'll see it's a limestone countryside. You'll see caves everywhere. This particular cave is where we repeatedly sampled bats and found every single genetic element of the original SARS outbreak strain of, um, of coronavirus. Um, as you go into that cave, you see a fireplace at the front of the cave where farmers who are tending to their cattle stop and shelter from the rain and build a little fire. Um, you see people going in and out of these caves, digging guano out to use as fertilizer. And the bats that fly out every night fly right over people's houses. Um, the bats carry these coronaviruses in their GI tract. They poop, urinate, and people get exposed and get infected. Um, and, and we think this happens very, very often. Uh, we think these are not such rare events. The pandemic is the rare event, but the actual exposure of people is incredibly rich. Uh, when, by the way, when we go in the caves, we wear these sorts of outfits, but you will regularly see people walking in in flip-flops and, um, and T-shirts. So we've done a lot of sampling of bats in China, about 16,000 bats um, captured, sampled, and released back to where they came from. We found viruses that are extremely close to SARS that can bind to human cells that can cause disease in lab mouse, mice that are exactly the same as SARS. We've spoken to people in the region. If you look at the red triangle at, at, on this graph, on the left-hand side, it's a map of what drives emerging diseases. And it tells you that land use change, wildlife trade, deforestation, is a real hotspot right there where that red triangle is. That's where we found bats carrying these viruses. On the, on the right-hand side um, is, is the estimated diversity of viruses in the region. So everything's coming together in these regions. A lot of land use change, a lot of diversity of wildlife, a lot of viral diversity. So it's no surprise that when we talk to people there, first of all, they eat wildlife, they see them regularly, they're bitten by them and they have a relationship with nature that's very intimate. Um, and they have antibodies to bat origin coronaviruses, even before COVID. We estimate that about one to seven million people in this region are exposed every single year um, to bat coronaviruses. They get infected. Some of them may get sick. We never know about it because it's a cough or something. If they get over it and move on, they may die and not get to a clinic. There may be small outbreaks that never get diagnosed. We've seen that in other diseases. So this is what we're up against, a, a background rate of spillover that's driving pandemic risk caused by things like deforestation and the un, un, um, uncontrolled, unsustainable wildlife trade. So how can we fix this? And the, we, we need to fix really um, working with the communities that are involved in this risk. So we look, we're talking to communities in the region. Um, 
through local interpreters in the local dialects, asking them what they do with wildlife. If they eat wildlife, why? What are the incentives? Could we change it? We talk about living safely with wildlife, about understanding the value of wildlife. Um, bats, fruit bats that pollinate your fruit trees, that get rid of mosquitoes, etc., and try and um, reinforce the value of wildlife. We talk with um, the private sector that that buys and consumes palm oil. We talk with the consumers in the in Europe and North America that have fur in the fashion industry, that have palm oil products throughout their kitchen and bathroom about how that might be driving some of that risk and what can be done to, to do that better. This is a palm oil plantation in Borneo. And what we're doing with palm oil uh, growers there is to talk about the cost of the outbreaks to their workers and their staff um, caused by this um, unsustainable um, land use change and how they can do it in a way that's safer. And I think that's what we've got to try and look for. Winds that the a, a value to the private sector to the public and to the global community that's at risk from these pandemics. And finally, of course, the illegal wildlife trade and the legal wildlife trade and trying to um, make the, the legal wildlife trade more sustainable and safer and to enforce the, the legislation against the illegal wildlife trade more significantly. So I want to hand over now to um, Susan and thank you very much for listening. I look forward to questions. Cheers. Peter, thank you very much for that. I know there will be lots of questions. And a reminder to, to those uh, who will be asking questions on the Zoom call, you can use the raise hand option or chat privately to me at any time throughout this event. Um, it's obvious, uh, Peter, that the continued and in, in many cases worsening health and economic impacts of this pandemic are being felt widely. It's also clear that we need a strong prevention strategy to keep something like this or worse from happening again. One of the efforts you proposed is working on uh, deforestation to reduce deforestation and address land use change. So let's now hear from Dr. Sarah Olson, um, who will speak to us about the effects of land use and deforestation on human health. Sarah? Thank you, Susan. Um, it's a good morning, everyone. And my thanks to ICCF uh, for hosting this event and to everyone participating in today's briefing. I'll be talking about land use, deforestation, and human health in the context of the present pandemic. I've been a researcher in this interdisciplinary field of study for over 15 years with a joint PhD in both public health and environment and resources from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So here are the four ideas I want to share with you today. First, degradation of ecosystems has complex effects on diverse aspects of human health. The degradation of ecosystems is happening on a huge scale, as Peter alluded to. 75% of the terrestrial and 66% of the marine environment have been severely altered to date by human actions. And predictably, this degradation is having effects on human health. Second, ecological degradation, including habitat encroachment and the harvest and trade in wildlife species, increases human wildlife contact, and that increases the overall threat of zoonotic disease outbreaks originating from wildlife, like COVID-19 and SARS before it. Third, preventing deforestation and thereby decreasing contacts and the threat of pathogen spillover is a highly cost-effective intervention. Last, another critical intervention point related to land management and use is the commercial wildlife trade. Our recommendation for US government action is to close the commercial wildlife trade, support sustainable food resources for indigenous people and implement scalable animal source food security programs for urban and peri-urban communities. Let's start with a 10,000 foot view. We're in a situation where human activities have broken down natural zoonotic disease barriers and exposed the world to greater infectious disease risk. The good news is we can repair those natural barriers and gain numerous human health benefits. At a very fundamental level, biodiversity is essential to human life on earth. WHO captured this in a 2015 report. And the report covers everything from the air we breathe provided by trees to the water we drink with wetlands providing pathogen filtering services to the food we eat, as well as mental, physical, and cultural aspects of daily health. It also provides a large cabinet chest, of medicines and ideas relevant to human medical discovery. I'll mostly be talking about forests today, but keep in mind these connections apply to other biomes. For instance, in marine systems, nutrient pollution causes harmful algal blooms in dead zones, and degraded savanna grassland systems compromise livestock production. So here's one example of intact forest and its impact on the second leading cause of death in children under age five diarrheal disease. 
Uh, using data from 35 developing countries highlighted in the map, researchers found a 30% increase in upstream tree cover was similar to the effect of improved sanitation on reducing childhood diarrheal risk. So healthy intact forests support childhood health and can lower water treatment costs in downstream urban areas. Let's turn our attention back to the current pandemic and the connection between environmental degradation and zoonotic disease outbreaks that originate in wildlife. So various pathways and mechanisms lead to increased human exposure to zoonotic pathogens. One of the most recognized links is change in land use and its influences on contact rates between people and wildlife. This graphic, as from a study of forest fragments around Kabali National Park, shows how this process happens. As forest edges increased, human wildlife contact increased as well. The impact of degradation is then multiplied by activities that lengthen the edge between intact areas and people. These activities include road building, logging camps, uh, and the expansion of the human footprint. So if we halt degradation, we can reduce contact and pathogen transmission. Now the edges or contact points between wildlife and people are the front lines of the next spillover. The required stages of spillover or pathogen spillover from wildlife to a global pandemic starts with the reservoir host being at sufficient density to maintain the pathogen. That pathogen is released or shed into the environment and results in either human or livestock exposure to the pathogen. And once in humans or livestock, it has to overcome additional barriers like cell entry, innate immune responses, and molecular compatibility. If the pathogen clears those steps, it can successfully spill over into one person, but the size of the human outbreak will then depend on the pathogen's ability to spread human to human beyond that index case. Now, as a conservation organization, it's not surprising that we focus on wildlife, intact forests and edges, but we're rather unique in having eyes in the field in some 60 countries and a health program. As such, we have and are well positioned to use our field presence and deep conservation expertise to reduce global public health risks from zoonotic pathogens. Here are pathogens originating in wildlife that are associated with ecosystem degradation and anthropogenic activities. It boils down to activities that end up creating those edges between wildlife and people. To reduce the likelihood of these events, we need to both remove and mitigate those edges. This picture shows one of my colleagues testing carcass samples as part of a community carcass surveillance program that began in the mid 2000s. So the idea is to detect Ebola in wildlife where it can cause high mortality before it spills over into people living in remote villages in the Republic of Congo. And from there possibly jump on an airplane for an overnight flight to anywhere in the world. So beyond case studies and the observational research that's been done, lots of modeling groups, including Peters, have used different approaches and techniques to reach the same conclusion. But degradation increases zoonotic disease risks. This is a figure from a study that looked at forested land conversion and projected epidemic size. Basically, you can see as intact forest, shown in green in those bottom um, mini landscapes, is converted to other use, shown in yellow, the average size of the projected epidemic increases until so much land is converted, the average size of the risk declines again. In other words, risk peaks at these intermediate levels of habitat loss, and this all comes back to how degradation impacts contact. So what can Congress do? I'm going to speak to two important and actionable points, preventing deforestation and land use protections, and actions to halt the harvest of wildlife for commercial trade. The first high quality economic analysis came out recently and shows just how affordable it is to prevent deforestation. So the authors reviewed the cost of policies that reverse the deforestation trends in the Amazon between 2005 and 2012 and the amount of zoonotic high risk tropical areas. Now the price tag to protect 40% of the forest at highest risk for spillover is about $10 billion in direct payments. Another option would be to simply remove existing subsidies at a cost of $1.5 billion annually. Better yet, uh, they actually pay for themselves when the ancillary benefits of reduced carbon emissions are considered. So the planet literally comes out in the green with eight to $17 billion in carbon benefits from these investments alone. Not even considering other cost savings like those from reducing diarrheal diseases in children. Meanwhile, the current pandemic is certainly an outlier, but damages currently are estimated to range in the tens of trillions. Now on the commercial trade front, Animals are harvested from unprotected forests and lands and moved into industrialized centers, crammed with thousands of live animals and hundreds of species, both wild and domestic. And this type of urban and peri-urban wildlife consumption behavior is in, sits in stark contrast, uh, contrast with indigenous people and local communities that consume for subsistence. Furthermore, these urban and peri-urban markets constitute true cauldrons of contagion. Uh, they increase contact, 
Um, they provide mixing opportunities that can create more dangerous pathogens, and they amplify the amount of the virus. In one of our observational studies of these markets, wildlife products were touched seven times per hour on average. Add to that all the vendors and customers that are circulating, purchasing, and slaughtering, it all generates these spillover opportunities. Then there is viral mixing. Uh, the urban trade creates opportunities for pathogens to become more dangerous through viral recombination and reassortment. This occurs when two or more genomes, viral genomes, co-infect the same host cell and then can exchange their genetic segments. And we just published a study documenting the urban trade carries yet a third spillover punch, greatly increasing the number of infected wildlife. In our study of the Vietnamese rat trade, we found trade in live animals amplifies the risk along the value chain. So the trade co-mingles species from many different geographies and habitats that would never have otherwise come into contact which induces stress, injury, sickness, and compromises their immune systems. Now the chance of finding coronavirus and RNA among field rats destined for consumption significantly increased from the wild, where typically zero to 2% of rodents are positive along the supply chain where we tested traders um, to large markets and to restaurants. So we looked at all of those interfaces. And by the time the rodent was slaughtered in the restaurant, there was more than a 50-50 chance that we could detect a coronavirus. Now the good news is change is possible. Our team partnered with other international and multilateral organizations in recent months to help influence policy in Vietnam. As a result, the Prime Minister of Vietnam announced a directive that calls for heightened enforcement of existing laws on illegal wildlife trade. It's not a, as, as, as game changing as reported by the global media. And uh, we recognize that more work needs to be done on this front, but it's a step in the right direction. Data on the value of the commercial wildlife trade for consumption is sparse but the global total annual value of wildlife harvesting is estimated to be at $400 billion. Now land use restrictions on commercial harvesting are a good step and the economic analysis on the policy side says it's affordable too. That same economic analysis I, that was done earlier, I mentioned earlier, estimates it would cost $20 billion annually to end the wild meat trade in China. Finally, I wanna emphasize that forest protections and ending the commercial trade are important health interventions for food insecure communities who are finding their forests depleted and emptied of wildlife due to commercial demand. My colleagues in Africa are vocal in recognizing business as usual, usual cannot continue. And to assist communities struggling with food insecurity while reducing the risk of spillover, multi-sectoral One Health approaches that span food security, resiliency, biodiversity, and global health programs are needed to establish and scale up animal source foods. I'll end here with some additional resources, my email if you'd like to get in touch, and I look forward to your questions. Sarah, thank you so much. We, um, we've been joined by several members of Congress and of the International Conservation Caucus. I'd like to first welcome Congresswoman Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Betty McCollum, um, co-chair of the International Conservation Caucus. Congresswoman. Let's make sure you're unmuted. Two. Now you we, can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Sometimes it's a two-step unmute. Sometimes it's a one-step. This was a two-step. So thank well, thank you to all the speakers. You weren't muted. I just heard I heard some great uh, presentation here. Uh, as one of the co-chairs of the International Conservation Caucus, I appreciate the opportunity to learn more about the global environmental facilities uh, respond to COVID-19. It's clear that our human behavior, and as was just pointed out by the previous speaker, our interactions with environment and the wildlife play a leading role in the uh, emergence and then the prevalence of these pandemics, including the disruption of the fragile ecosystems. Deforestation, climate change, growing, uh, growing uh, global population, all of this, all of this uh, is a part of the dangerous wildlife trade. It all pulls together. So um, I want you to know as the chair of the Interior Environment Subcommittee, I help lead the increased funding for international programs through US Fish and Wildlife and uh, Service and especially the US International Forest Service because I know tremendously the impact these investments had. I saw it firsthand in Malawi uh, about a year ago. It was absolutely amazing to watch Forest Service work with uh, Malawi youth to put down skits and plays about wildlife trafficking. And then I had an opportunity to uh, join some of the officials from Malawi 
calling upon the courts to really uphold uh, convictions and to move forward faster when they have uh, caught, uh, in this case, it was a Chinese national involved in, in this ring of wildlife trafficking. Um, so we know we need to uh, have this uh, collaboration between our counterparts to help com uh, combat wildlife trafficking. We need to promote co uh, conservation, biodiversity, and to support sustainable government all at the same time. So I'm, I'm all in on the smart investments, and I think you have led uh, the way in which uh, we can advance our, our shared conservation goals internationally. Uh, and this is also going to require Congress to be a partner in these international efforts. So um, I have some questions. So let me know when what, when you want me to ask one. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I understand that um, Congressman Rutherford and Congressman Carter um, also have a little bit of time. So if that is okay with everyone, why don't we hear from our final presenter, um, Mark Zimsky, who will speak about the global environment facilities. Uh, work on deforestation and promoting sustainable landscapes and in the Amazon region and how other activities are changing in response to COVID-19. So we'll turn it over to Mark and then we will start questions. Mark? I've been asked to give a quick overview of our program in the Amazon, which we call the Amazon Sustainable Landscapes Program. And I'll put it in the context of the previous two speakers, Peter and Sarah, and you can think of this now as a kind of proactive response towards future uh, potential zoonotic risks that may stem from the Amazon. So look at the array of interventions we're doing in that light. Uh, in her introduction, Susan had mentioned the raison d'etre of the Jeff, and there's no place where the Jeff is more important than in the Amazon, given its global importance from a biodiversity perspective. It's the world's largest freshwater system, and it's a carbon sink of uh, uh, very high uh, proportions with up to 140 billion metric tons of carbon uh, stored in existing <clears throat> standing forests. And the Jeff exists to pay for the additional costs that countries mm -hmm. undertake, the additional actions they undertake to uh, generate global benefits from biomes such as this, from a biodiversity and a climate change mitigation perspective. The program itself builds on a history of Jeff investment in the Amazon, over approximately 50 projects and half a billion dollars to date leveraging $2 billion of co-financing from other partners. And the objective of this current program, which builds on this history, is to protect globally important biodiversity and implement policies to foster sustainable land use and restoration of native vegetation cover in the Amazon. When you reflect on that, given the previous two presentations, you can see this emphasis on integral landscapes and connected landscape, landscapes is also very important from a pandemic risk perspective. The program is implemented under four main pillars or components. One looking at the existing national protected area state and improving its management from a finance capacity and institutional sustainability perspective, not just through the national system of protected areas, but also indigenous and community conserved areas, which are often uh, the best managed uh, complementing that is support to actions in the productive landscape by the private sector to improve and enhance those activities in such a way that they're at least biodiversity neutral or biodiversity positive and that they proceed with uh, zero illegal deforestation tolerance. Supporting both of those pillars is a policy and incentive component, looking to strengthen the regulatory uh, framework and the implementation of existing laws uh, while trying to provide financial incentives, which Sarah referenced, for private actors to maintain forest cover and to manage agriculture in a sustainable way that doesn't degrade the ecosystem services provided by the biome itself. And finally, within our program, we have a regional coordination and capacity building component that looks to build institutional capacity at a national level through an elaborate 
South to South exchange program where restoration experts from Brazil are sharing their technologies with colleagues in Peru and Colombia to cite one example from the first phase of this program. The program is being implemented in two phases. The first phase is underway now, it's for five years. And it was focused initially on Brazil, Colombia, and Peru, given that they uh, encompass in their territory more than 80% of the actual biome itself. And you can see in this slide that each country is expressing their priorities of combining protected area management with working in their productive landscapes <clears throat> to advance uh, ecosystem integrity at a national level. We have complemented that with a second phase of funding, which starts next year and will run another five years. It builds on the work done in Brazil, <coughs> Colombia, and Peru during the first phase of the program, but has brought in four other countries, Bolivia, Ecuador, Guiana, and Suriname, to spread the footprint of the program and to build on <clears throat> this emphasis on establishing ecosystem connectivity and integrated landscapes <clears throat> that use protected areas as the core strategy, but that build upon it work in the productive landscapes to ensure uh, the integrity of large intact uh, areas of forest. At a cumulative level, these two phases of the program will uh, protect or better manage 95 million hectares of protected areas, close to 33 million uh, hectares of productive landscape, a small element of restoration, and the project is expected to mitigate 225 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a snapshot of what we're trying to do. And if you reflect upon it, within the context of what we've just heard, these are all building blocks to maintain uh, intact ecosystems, which is a defense for future zoonotic uh, risk in the Amazon. Now the project is adapting its implementation given what's happening in South America and in the participating countries. And there are four main areas of focus that they are uh, responding with. One is, an ongoing assessment of the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 in the, in the participating countries, looking in particular as countries try to build back post-COVID, and we're looking at the recovery phase here, to ensure that financing for an economic recovery isn't going to undermine the overall objectives of the uh, existing program. And the project teams are trying to ensure that these new funding programs will be tied to sustainable practices. As I just, uh, presented earlier in this uh, PowerPoint, a big pillar of the program is strengthening the implementation of existing environmental regulations and policy, which are quite robust on paper in many of the participating countries but there's fear that there may be an easing of these environmental regulations, giving the pressures to build back after the uh, pandemic. And project teams are now working to strengthen that element of project implementation. As in terms of medium term or future term planning, there's an expected increase in development policy and financing and loans. And the project teams are, are trying to ensure that existing environmental safeguards of these institutions that might be providing these resources are applied as rigorously as possible. Finally, the regional coordination component, which does a lot of uh, technical capacity building that's applicable to all the participating countries, is now looking at, with institutions based in Brazil, analyzing areas where zoonotic risks might have a high potential. And looking at areas the project may target to ensure that habitat fragmentation and biodiversity loss will not contribute to that uh, potential future risk. But I think in conclusion, you could see in this very rapid presentation with these pillars of the program, that this program in the Amazon and many other Jeff programs in other parts of the world are looking at this interface between 
human land use and forest management to support uh, more sustainable management of forest resources, both through a protection lens and also a sustainable management and uh, lens. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm open to any questions and welcome. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate your presentation as we do for all the panelists this morning. We'd now like to start taking questions. We will start with Congresswoman McCollum, then move on to Congressman Rutherford Carter and um, Congressman Garamendi, who I believe is joining us um, as we speak. So Chairman McCollum, please ask your question. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm gonna try to keep this compact, so I'm gonna, and it's all intertwined. So what are some of the international dialogues and uh, collaboration that you think we're missing prior? We heard a little bit of it from you prior to the pandemic. And has it improved as, as the in, in international communities kind of tried to work together on, on COVID-19? Um, so for example, what do you think uh, US Fish and Wildlife and Forest Service, what could they be doing that, that maybe needs to change up or be a little different? And then um, we know that we're integrated in a global community, right? So in some of the slides, the World Bank and the UN were put up there too. So what kind of investments or what kind of engagement should the United States be having with these international organizations and not just Fish and Wildlife and Forest Service? Because uh, we're all in this together. This is international public health when it, when it all goes wrong uh, with these pandemics, so. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. So um, who would like to take that first from the panelists? Peter? Yeah, really good question. Well, the the um, Fish and Wildlife has jurisdiction on something really critical here in the US, which is the import of wildlife into the US. We've had a series of outbreaks from animals imported for the pet industry, for labs, for other sources. Um, and they have limited powers. I think that there are, there are efforts right now on the Hill to look at those powers. Um, who does the testing at the airports to see what diseases are coming in? It's very minimal. Um, and Fish and Wildlife doesn't have jurisdiction on that. So looking to expand their jurisdiction or to uh, get them to do the right collaborations. On an international scale, there really is a gap. And I think what, what you're seeing here is the conservation community globally saying, look, Pandemics are driven by this. It affects conservation. We work on this. Let's get involved. So supporting initiatives with WHO that deal with the environment, but really focusing on the environment is what we need. Um, supporting initiatives with um, global efforts like the IPBES, IPBES, the um, IPCC for biodiversity, that's currently looking at those, um, those risk factors. And I think there, there is a a real um, urgency to which organization is going to deal with the underlying drivers linked into the health side. I think the focus needs to be on two issues, deforestation and the wildlife trade. And if Jeff manages a lot of that, I think that's extremely useful. But to link in with the health side, we need coordination with WHO, maybe through the CBD, maybe through ITBES. Um, but that, that definitely needs to happen, but driven by conservation first, because that's where the big issue is. Over. Thank you, Peter. Sarah, Mark, Ken, do either of you, any of you want to address this question or shall we move on to the next one? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Uh, John Rutherford here. I'd like to ask a, a question uh, about EcoHealth Alliance and Peter, uh, what you all are doing with the with, with the predict program, uh, I think when you when you consider, I think in in some remarks I saw, for every dollar of investment in conservation and those things, you get forty five in return, uh, because of the uh, potential cost of, of pandemics and those things. So, so I guess my question is, uh, number one. What else can we in Congress do? Uh, I know that's funded through USAID, I believe. So that obviously the funding piece, uh, but then the, the, so what else can Congress do to help that program particularly? And then secondly, uh, this program was in place 
I, I presume it was in place uh, when COVID-19 broke out. And coming out of, um, you know, th there's a lot of debate right now whether it came out of the lab in Wuhan or it came out of the forest north of there. Um, can, can you talk about how it is that we missed COVID-19 uh, through the pandemic or through the uh, PREDICT program? And, and how do we stop that from happening again? Well, I'll, I'll be as, as quick as I can. I, I, really good, good points. Look, first of all, the PREDICT program is visionary and, and really important. What it critically does is it, it says that emerging diseases are, a, are an international development issue um, and that we can predict them and therefore prevent them. Uh, Ten years of research showed us that we can predict them. We can find out where the diversity of viruses are in the wild, in animals that could emerge into communities on the front line of risk, like the people in southern China, who probably were the first to pick up COVID-19. Um, it, it did actually do a lot for COVID-19. The PREDICT project led to the discovery of over 780 um, genetic sequences of related bat coronaviruses, including the two closest to, co to SARS coronavirus 2. Um, I think, you know, that the, the issue of what could be done to better handle that in the future, um, mm -hmm. really the key issue, and why, I mean, I don't think we missed it. I think what we did is we weren't engaged enough with the country where it emerged, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, cutting ourselves off from um, international relationships with places that are difficult to work in, like China, that may have different political views, but are the origins of what we now have crashing our economy is short-sighted um, and needs to change. Mm -hmm. um, pathogens don't respect political borders. They don't care what ethnicity, religion, political views we have. They look at us as organisms to infect and move on. And once right. they're out, once they're in a rural population, start to spread into a city like Wuhan. It's so, so, Peter, if, if, if I could interrupt and ask one more question, but before you tell me how we can help you uh, more with this program, uh, the 780 that they found with the coronavirus within the bats uh, in, in South China, um, but the zoonotic diseases, do we know how this actually made the leap into the, into the human environment? Has that been determined yet? or? Or do you also, does this program, the, the PREDICT program, does it also try to predict whether that uh, disease or virus will jump to the, the human genome? Well, I have to also give credit to NIAD, uh, Tony Fauci's um, division of NIH, which also funded uh, over 10 years of work in China to look at these viruses. Um, yes, it does. It, what it tells us is, if we do this correctly, we can predict from the genetic code of the virus which ones are able to make that leap. So we know where those risky viruses are. There's a lot of talk about handling risky viruses, working with them. We can work with the genetic code alone to predict a lot of that. Then we know where to put our efforts for surveillance. Now, um, Sarah Olson's talking about WCS's work in Vietnam. <coughs> The countries that are adjacent to Yunnan include Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam. Um, there may be other viruses there, and we need to look there too. Um, we can predict this. We can prevent it if we do it right. Right. Let me just jump. Listen, jump. I, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I, I hate to have to run, but I've got to make another phone call at 11. Well, I appreciate you. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just to kind of build on what's already been said, I think one of the other important things that's a gap is just our ability to see what's happening in wildlife populations around the world and to get more eyes in the field and to build wildlife health surveillance programs so that we can get this information. Not all animal diseases are, are going to cause mortality or issues in wildlife, but we should be uh, constructing systems so that we can pick up any, any die-offs in, in wildlife. And, um, we have tools where we can get out to rangers, smartphones and information collection with communities, um, building on some of the systems we've done in Republic of Congo, where we have villagers telling us when they come across the dead gorilla carcass, we just had two chimpanzees come in earlier this week. And we can use that information to more rapidly inform and to really get at this interface quickly before it becomes an issue in people. 
Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Congressman. This is a conversation that we definitely look forward to facilitating more of. This is, this is the kind of dialogue that's gonna be extremely helpful going forward. Um, Congressman Carter, you're on the line and would you like to unmute yourself and say a few words, please? I would, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Good, good. First of all, let me thank all of you for the important work that you're doing. You know, this is, this is truly a team effort here. Regardless of, of what part you're working on this pandemic, we all need to be working together. I'm a healthcare professional. Currently, I'm the only pharmacist serving in Congress. In fact, before I got on this call, on this virtual call, I was on a doctor's caucus call with representatives from Bio. And we were focusing primarily on, you know, vaccine, vaccines, on, on therapeutics and what we can expect, where we're at, the, the progress that we've made. And, and my question is this, how can, how can this group and how can we incorporate public health objectives together with this group? In other words, I, I know that we're, we're looking at, at trying to prevent the the um, emergence of the infectious disease, but also how do we work together to stop the spread once it, it, once it has started? Thank you for the excellent question, Congressman. Uh, who from the panel would like to address that for us, Peter? Uh, very briefly, a really interesting question because we're talking here about prevention, but what do we do once, once the disease emerges? Well. A lot of the work that Sarah and I have been doing to find viruses in wildlife is directly used by vaccine producers. Some of the bat origin coronaviruses that we found um, in, in Southeast Asia were used to test remdesivir and vaccine candidates to see if they work against not just SARS, but a broad range of viruses. So the raw material for testing these drugs and designing better vaccines comes from the sort of wildlife work that Sarah and, and our group do, that WCS and our group do. Um, so I do think we play a role there too. Um, I don't think it's widely known, but um, remdesivir works against a whole host of bat coronaviruses that haven't even emerged yet. That shows that it, these things could be of value to the future, vaccines as well. And, and you know, so there is a strategy there. Another strategy is coming back to the wildlife trade, ending the commercial wildlife trade. I think that's an important um, aspect that we can work on. And it is a team effort. I, you know, I, my colleague, uh, Peter, and I have been working on this. I, I was just thinking about it going back to 2004. This has been our focus. I think another uh, important space is, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, um, is the One Health um, kind of approach to these issues is to bring together on our side, we're working in communities in, in Vietnam and we're bringing together ministries of health, ministry of ag, um, the forestry ministries. These folks are coming together and having these conversations. We can do that more on our side and we can also do that more strategically as we fund these um, efforts to, to combat this in the future. Thank you, Sarah. Would anyone else like to address the question or shall we move on? Okay, we, we literally have about a half a minute left. We have a number of questions from congressional offices, which we will submit to the panelists um, after the fact and get answers back to the offices. But I would like to call on Alan Fairham from Congressman Fortenberry's office to ask a question. Alan, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Okay, uh, thanks for organizing this, um, Susan, and thank you uh, for all the great presentations. Uh, this question for Sarah, Mark, and Kent. And um, so when we look at the broad reaching policy responses to limit the harvesting and the consumption of the wildlife, they're likely to disproportionately impact the rural and indigenous communities that rely on this wildlife uh, as a food or an income source. And so I was wondering, how do you approach the response to this crisis in a way that balances the need to mitigate the risk of wildlife borne diseases that we were talking about um, with the, um, uh, that they'd emerge in the humans and the needs of the indigenous communities. And I guess more broadly, how does Jeff ensure that its projects are inclusive and respectful of the rights of the indigenous communities? Thank you, Alan. And before we go to answer, um, Congressman Carter, did, did you have something else to say? I believe I inadvertently might have interrupted you. Okay. Okay, well then um, we'll move on. Who would like to take the first, um, 
first response. To I'll Alice. just quickly jump in. I think we do need to commercial close the commercial wildlife trade with support um, to offer these indigenous peoples and communities that those need to be, I mean, it's all context specific. A market is, a commercial market is very different than, than these contexts where indigenous people and communities are using these uh, resources for uh, their sustainable protein source. Um, and so in those contexts, we do need to work to mitigate the risk. We need to provide alternative protein sources that are safe. We need to think about, um, you know, backyard poultry, fish, guinea pigs as needed uh, to kind of problem solve our way through to make sure that they have the resources they need. Thank you, Sarah. Mark? Yeah, just to follow up on Sarah's intervention, uh, and Kent can build on this as well. Part of the work of the Jeff Task Force is trying to tease out these elements of a response so that there are no unintended negative consequences, such as taking a protein source off the table for local people. And uh, so the task force is looking at that in the advice it fashions for the GF and its project design, specifically to your question about how do GF programs ensure that there is no unintended negative consequences to indigenous peoples and local communities. We have a very well-developed system of environmental and social safeguards that each and every Jeff project has to apply uh, and uh, implement and a, uh, an indigenous people's participation plan and a stakeholder participation plan is included as part of that. But the Jeff agencies and the Jeff Secretariat itself take that issue quite seriously and our council has approved a, a rigorous set of safeguards that we do apply. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Kent, do you want to answer that question? Yes, I'll just say briefly that it's an excellent question, uh, it, but it requires, as Sarah has suggested, that, that you tease apart whether or not there are local uses or commercial uses. And much of the best meat, the animals that are would provide the most protein also have the highest market prices. And so they're passing through that, away from the potential to feed children in indigenous villages and going into a market as a way of earning cash. So we have to ask whether or not there aren't better ways to provide cash income that would allow larger animals to be kept and consumed while at the same time recognizing that, that the, the disease issues that both Peter and Sarah have laid out continue to take place in these transitions to local folks. And so appropriate health care that allows the detection and the treatment of those very early on is also an important part of any solution uh, in this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. I'd now like to um, wrap up by saying thank you to our panelists, to the Jeff, the COVID-19 task force, congressional staff, and, and, and of course, members of Congress. As we've discussed throughout this briefing, there is no reason to think that an outbreak like COVID-19 or worse could not happen again. And so it is critical that initiatives like the Jeff's COVID-19 multi-stakeholder task force exist, working to find collaborative solutions. If uh, anyone listening would like more information on the task force and the Jeff's COVID response, please visit thejeff.org. Um, again, let this be the beginning of conversations, not the end. Everyone stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.